During the research leading up to this conference, I tried to read or reread as many of the headlining books on reading instruction uh, as possible from speakers who would be here or elsewhere. Uh, and as I progressed through them, I began to notice a common rhetorical technique in the introductory chapters of those books, right? The place where we uh, motivate the reader as to the importance of, of the topic. And uh, I found that most, uh, it was striking, began their treatises, their explorations, uh, primarily with a series of alarming statistics about the depressing state of our national reading performance as measured by state tests. And don't misunderstand me. They are, indeed, simultaneously motivating and paralyzing. And it is a valid concern. But I don't plan to start there at all. Cue the rhetorical technique of paralipsis, where you mention that you will not mention something and therefore get to mention it without the consequences of having mentioned it. Fair enough. But in all seriousness, I, I might propose that as we start our day together, we reflect on a different standard of measurement to begin our time. For classical education, teaches us to consider the means in light of the end. As such, perhaps we can begin with the end in mind. Let us remind ourselves where we are headed when we strive to teach a child to read well. Let us consider what it is in the act of reading that expresses and even cultivates our humanity. And perhaps to do that, we should go back to the beginning. Consider what first prompted the human race to read. In his fascinating book on the history of reading, Robert Fisher argues anthropologically uh, that it was humanity's thirst for knowledge and love of learning that served as the first kindling to incipient reading. And that was the oral tradition that first captured uh, the stories, the ideas across time and space for us. Somehow there was something in the printed word that allows us to, to have something of greater permanence and power to construct a more complete narrative arc of our own history. Consider, as Fisher does, at least for us, that all of history's known languages and cultures only endure through reading. In this way, we uh, are allowed to participate in the history of human drama that attests to the glory and struggle of our common past. He calls reading the immortal witness to our great tradition. And so that brings us to another thought, that reading is an essential act of community. And perhaps this seems counterintuitive. Perhaps most of us picture reading as a solitary event in contrast to dialogue. But consider how readings were treated in the earliest days. For example, a public reading, where a speaker would deliver, whether he was the original writer or not, the written word orally to be shared among the community. Think of the reading that prepares us for community through seminar. And even when we read in solitude, are we not fundamentally drawn into fellowship with the writers we are reading? Reading is fodder for conversation, and it is, has the power to draw us into the great conversation. In our digital age, an age in which perhaps deep reading is being driven out in many ways in our lives, it is important to remember the older techne of the book and what it requires of us and builds in us. A particular discipline, a discipline of mind, a discipline of body, a discipline of spirit. Coded print demands us to submit ourselves first to its order of symbolism and syntax, if we are to access its content. And if the content is any good, it will then ask us to submit ourselves to the order of logic and truth, and perhaps ultimately to the order of the cosmos. As Jacques Barzun says, reading, therefore, is not just a device 
a tool, to use the jargon, by which we are reached and reach others for practical ends. It is also, and far more importantly, a mode of incarnating and shaping thought. Reminds me a little bit of Flannery O'Connor's language yesterday. This task of reading requires us to bring to bear everything that we have learned to this point in order to understand the text, but at the service of it. The reward for this quite difficult process, uh, certainly different perhaps than uh, many other adolescent digital mediums of today, is the unlocking of delight and increased capacity for wisdom. It is most needed if we are to engage in education in virtue. W.H. Auden quotes someone at the beginning of uh, the foreword to Barfield's History of English Words. He quotes, respect for the word is the first commandment in the discipline by which a man can be educated to maturity, intellectual, emotional, moral. Respect for word is the first commandment. And so we would say reading words, as much as counting numbers, is foundational to anything we would call a classical education. It is foundational to the mastery of language and thought itself. Today there's a, a great push, of course, to develop good writers, but as mimetic <laughs> beings, as Aristotle argues, we ought to take great care to what kind of readers we develop. I think of Andrew Pudua's uh, great reminder that we can only expect to get out of children in terms of language what we put in. He usually is, is talking about oral language there, but I think the same applies for reading. Language is the common denominator here. Uh, Dr. Willingham mentioned yesterday, reading is communication. And he talked about the connectedness of all forms of communication. And reading is one of the four core activities or means of communication. The other is, of course, being writing, listening, speaking. And of these four activities, two receptive in nature, two productive in nature, uh, two oral, two written, reading is the receptive skill of deciphering written language. And so when we, we teach children to do any of these well, we often talk about teaching the arts of language. One thing I was reflecting on, and I would encourage you to do the same, and I'd love to hear a conversation about this today, is that the classical tradition also speaks of the arts of language in a slightly different way, of course, as the arts of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. These make up the trivium, the first three of the seven liberal arts, uh, and these are quite venerated in our, in our tradition. So one thing I want to reflect on today is what is the connection uh, between these frameworks, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, rhetoric, logic, and grammar. I will offer a sister Miriam Joseph in her great book on the trivium, uh, basically identifies uh, the means of communication as reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Uh, that they are governed by the arts of logic, grammar, and rhetoric because they are the arts of communication. And of course, she then reminds us that in turn, the trivium is the organon or the instrument of education at all levels. But basically, it's an important to note that there's, there's an inherent relationship of instruction between these areas. On the one hand, to read well, to write well, to listen well, depends on training in the arts of the trivium, and it works the other way. Um, if you've read uh, Robert Littlejohn and Charles Evans' great book on wisdom and eloquence, um, they talk about the trivium training the skills of language, but that involved, of course, the mechanics of reading, writing, uh, and memory, along with instruction in, in, in a wealth of historical, cultural, and technical literature. So in essence, uh, to be trained in the trivium, you must be trained in these skills. But to be trained in these skills, you have to be trained in the trivium. So let us grant that uh, reading itself cannot be taught outside of an overall reverence and, and training in many areas connected to language, including the content that we are reading. But return to the end, the purpose of the liberal arts of instruction in the arts of language, 
It is to bestow one with the tools of language and number such that we might pursue wisdom. And that's why the hue of uh, St. Victor, for example, calls uh, the seven liberal arts the fittest entrance through which the way to philosophic truth is opened to our intellect. No pressure on us as teachers of reading. In fact, let's go back to Barzun. I think he, he says it well uh, and, and delicately. There is therefore no excuse for allowing the exercise of reading to be less certain in its results than the exercise of listening and remembering. To tolerate reading that proceeds by guesswork is to commit an injury against the growing mind. To allow the written word to be indefinite is to undo the incalculable technological advance that consisted in transfixing sounds by sign. On this pedagogic ground alone, he argues, it could be said that no subject of study is more important than reading. So there you have it. We must remember, on the one hand, that why we do this is of the utmost importance. We cannot lose sight of our purpose and our principles in our instruction. And we would also say, how we do this is of the utmost importance. We cannot leapfrog over the proper steps in our pursuit of that goal. So we have philosophy as the end, the love of wisdom as the end, and reading as the beginning means. Uh, Dan Scoggin helped me articulate, if philosophy is the king of the sciences, then reading is the key to the kingdom. I want to take a moment to just reflect on the definition of reading as we start uh, our time today. And this is what's interesting, because within that definition, I think you'll actually hear both the purpose, uh, the end, and the means within the definition. If we start with a simple common definition of reading, reading is the ability to discern accurately ideas communicated in print. Reading is the ability to discern accurately the ideas, any ideas communicated in print, print being our written form of the language. And so we can hear two components in there. We can hear uh, that in our discernment, it is toward ideas, but we hear that it must be through decoding print. This complex skill set allows a reader to translate the logographic code into words, sentences, and ideas. This is why we call it decoding, of course. It is the ability to process coded language. The other part is that we are uh, ultimately trying to cultivate an interaction with the ideas embedded there in print. And it was Marilyn Adams, uh, in her great book, uh, Beginning to Read, Thinking and, and Learning About Print, that helped me reflect further uh, why perhaps then these reading debates uh, have come to be. It really centers on these two parts. The fact that we are trying ultimately to access ideas, content, comprehension, but we must do it through a very particular uh, code, coded form. And there, uh, as you know, uh, virulent debate uh, out there as to how best we do it. Nobody questions the importance of reading, just how we're going to get there and how fast. I would caution us, though, to be uh, careful a bit about lambasting um, the, the debate that is out there uh, debating methods of education is not a modern invention. Um, perhaps we ought to consider uh, making strident pedagogical claims from any singular sense of authority uh, within our classical tradition, uh, considering that our classical tradition is represented by two and a half millennia of strongly opinionated and often clashing perspectives. But at the end of the day, it is debated because it is highly complex and it's highly important. To emphasize them a little bit more, right, the, the phonics side, the code emphasizing approach, uh, which we submit to uh, and we love, really emphasizes the nature of the method of our written system. We follow both the research that we'll hear about today and the wisdom of the ancients uh, in placing emphasis on systematic 
intentional instruction around language, around the code. And today we're going to spend much of our time uh, hearing about how to do that well. What do we need to know and how do we implement it in the classroom? So this is uh, incredibly complex. Uh, and, I, and I really just want to pause because sometimes I think we can focus on the methodology so much we stri jump straight into the practicalities of, of what will work. Um, but if our end is wisdom, uh, we are reminded that wisdom begins in wonder. And so even as we emphasize the code today, uh, can we just pause once more and wonder at this process? The fact that the human brain is able to encode complex thought through written symbol? What's more, we are able in most cases to teach our youngest people, five to eight years old, the basic tools they need to unlock, decode, decipher practically any word or sentence that properly communicates an idea? I have no idea really how we do this. And yet, on the other hand, it would be, of course, foolish to call, uh, ignore a call to ensure that students are attending to the meaning of the text once they've broken that code, uh, for, to forget the purposes um, of reading. The problems have arisen in our reading instruction when we've wanted to jump to meaning so quickly we've skipped over the process of the code. But even today, as we recognize you need to go through the code, and we're trying to get at meaning. There's uh, it's Dan Copeland that really uh, helped articulate for me the second war in reading instruction, often surrounding uh, reading strategies and how we best develop uh, this reading comprehension. And so whether, it, whether reading comprehension should be knowledge-based or skill-based is another war that has kind of surfaced. I only want to remind ourselves here for the time being that both of these things, the idea of getting at meaning and having to do it through the code, uh, are embedded in the definition of reading. And we must focus both on the content and the habits and the skills and the language love and delight and our rich content all at the same time. The whole process is incredibly complicated, and even as Jeanette Zorneman was saying yesterday, it seems like the content itself will shape how we experience interacting with the print and with the ideas. Ultimately, reading comprehension, uh, I would uh, submit, is not just about translating the visual appearance of the print into words and a basic understanding, but rather it is the mind and soul's response. This component of reading, I would argue, captures the idea of reading comprehension as our goal in the fullest sense, and that is soulful absorption of the language and thought presented. So today, I propose that the conversation be less about a classical school's place, very specifically in much of these particular debates, but a rich consideration of what is the information that we need to know and what is the consideration that should be had in the instruction, really in the art of being human. So I don't propose a classical framework here uh, that's simple for reading instruction, certainly not a curriculum, um, but submit a couple principles perhaps uh, for us to consider as we uh, launch into our day together. One already mentioned, reading instruction must be kept in mind as to its highest purpose and its proper means. When we commit to this mantra of first things first, that means two things. First principles, a hierarchy of what is our first goal, but also what is our first step in getting there. We respect an ordered process of instruction and are very careful not to leapfrog. We must be clear on our first principles and how that informs practice. We ought to listen to the wisdom of the ages, which includes the research of the present. It is classical liberal arts institutions, I'll just say this briefly, were sometimes accused of clinging to stale old traditions and outdated methodologies simply because of nostalgia. And this cannot and should not be so. We remind ourselves that we do not cling to things simply because they are tradition. 
We respect the tradition because it tends to work. And we have an obligation to ensure that this is true. We ought to be able to test our methodology against empirical evidence that the education has good effect on its claims. We have to be careful, of course, on what the empirical evidence is measuring and what that can or cannot tell us about our ultimate aims and whether we're reaching them. But whenever possible, we ought to look at the research of our chosen practices of our curricula. We also must keep in mind that when we are reading, we are always reading something. And we must give quite a bit of deference to that which is good content. And even to the disciplines that we are reading, we must be careful that reading all of a sudden does not become the master of all of the disciplines and how we come to them. But we are ulti ultimately always cultivating habits and skills within the content, within the discipline, for the goal of a love and mastery of language, and also an appreciation and love and mastery of the content itself. Finally, I would just ask us as we start our today uh, that we work on this principle that teachers, in all the cases, teachers must be masters of their subject matter. And the K in the K-5 world, this is language and children. That's our subject matter. We must become masters of the content of language, including how we process language. And that's what we're going to hear a lot about today. How do we process? What are all those systems that we use to process language? How do we cultivate uh, those systems as well as the heart? So this is for all of us as teachers of English. And as my good friend Andrew Ellison reminds me, that none of you are exempt from this. Because if you instruct children in any way, and you do it using the English language, you are an English teacher. <laughs> so as we begin our day doing that, as teachers, immersing ourselves in the content and in the research around this topic, as we seek out information that affects process, I would ask us to return to the goal of education. Wisdom. Wisdom is having the knowledge, the experience, the ability to align ourselves to reality and make the proper decision in many sorts of situations accordingly. Again, it requires acquisition of knowledge, opportunity to practice, and a fundamental orientation toward humility. Reading, as we said earlier, cultivates wisdom ultimately because of each of these things. But I would return again that we as teachers must ultimately seek wisdom. As teachers of reading, we will talk about principles and practices, but all of this will have to be done through the wisdom of your experience in the classrooms. There's no simple curriculum to adopt. There is only knowledge which we seek, practice, and humility that we model and use for the good of our children.